Good afternoon. My name is Stefan Stefan. I'm the executive for data science at the Telcom Group. And I'll be talking to you about practicing AI for business. Let me share my screen. My team's name at the Telcom Group is uh, Telcom Strategic Insights. We're a team of 55 data scientists um, situated in the corporate center reporting into group strategy. Uh, we structured our team across the data value chain into these four components, data management, data engineering, insights, and artificial intelligence. And it's our objective to deliver tangible value through data science solutions within the group, but also to external partners and customers. As a strategic partner to the business, we aim to deliver transformative value within the telecom group. But we also aspire to deliver market-facing products and services that drive sustainable revenue diversification for the group. As I mentioned, our team is structured across these four disciplines, data management, engineering, insights and analytics, and artificial intelligence. On the data management side, we work towards embedding data management and data governance practices across the telecom group. This team also has responsibility for sourcing data we use in our data science solutions. On the data engineering side, we aim to be the standard and cloud platform and engineering service management for the group. We do most of our data science work on the Google Cloud platform, but we're also comfortable operating across the rest of the hyperscalers. Insights Analytics is really where we focus and uh, develop our techniques to solve problems using structured data. Um, and this uh, leverages advanced analytics as well as machine learning. But then in our AI team, we typically uh, focus on unstructured data and have done quite a bit of work on the natural language processing side and computer vision elements. Overall, we have to leverage these maturing capabilities to serve both our internal market and the telecom group, as well as the external market through innovative products and services. So that's a brief overview of Telcom Strategic Insights and where we fit into the group. And I'll spend some time on the practice of AI for business by sharing a few case studies. We'll start the process by focusing on speech services. So this is our speech services roadmap. Our objective is to become the primary provider of speech services for African languages and broad commercial applications. And we start that by delivering our Telcom speech APIs. So this really forms the core of a number of additional products and services that we're developing. First of these that we're launching at AI Expo this week is isWare.ai. This is a machine and human in the loop transcription platform where we're partnering with startup in Labeler uh, to take this to market. But more on that a little bit later. And then I want to share a little bit about some of the engagement we've had with SABC to deliver video content search uh, on their archives. And then uh, a quick view at some of the work we're doing in terms of contact center AI. First up, we have isware.ai, a new brand that we're launching for Africa. You can take a look at the site uh, at https isware.ai. This is a multilingual technology platform that transforms audio and video data to text in your local language. Yo, as you'll see, we're partnering with Enabler, a data annotation startup um, that delivers image annotation, audio annotation, and a number of other services. Um, but the core service that we're hoping to deliver here is both machine transcription as well as human in the what we talk about as human in the loop transcription. So assisted by uh, crowd-enabled labelers that can transcribe uh, text at the highest levels of accuracy. The use cases are endless. It can start as simple as transcribing an interview or be more complex. So automatically transcribing contact center audio um, to help deliver improved customer experience. It can support transcription of legal and government recordings or develop customized solutions for your use case. If you want to find out more, please listen to the talk, track talk by Esther Wurstadt and Kanisa Noganta a little bit later today. 
Moving on to AI and insights use cases in the media, in particular, I wanted to touch on some of the audio transcription work we engaged on with SABC in particular. I'll show an example of some of the video search, video content search that we created for the SABC. Um, and I'll not spend time on audience insights in particular, but just to point to the predictive work that's possible in the space, as well as the use of segmentation and targeting um, to improve insights. So this is an example of the, the web interface that we developed for the video processing of um, archived content for the SABC. Uh, at the top, you'll see an overview of the languages detected in the content already uploaded. So Sasutu Afrikaans, English, etc. Providing you with a mix of the language across the the video archives. Um, you'll see a list of uh, the videos and then search functionality that enables you to uh, very easily search across both the metadata, uh, the speech to text transcript, as well as the subtitles contained in the videos if there are subtitles. Right, so this gives you an example. If you then uh, click on a video, it'll take you to the specific spot in the video uh, where you'll then get a more detailed view of the of that search item. So you'll see the reference to Wendy uh, in the transcript. As part of this work, we also do actor recognition. Uh, so using face detection, I'll mention that uh, briefly a little bit later um, to identify the actors in each of the frames. Uh, you'll see again the language uh, detection, showing the overview of the languages used in this specific episode, as well as then a number of tags that have been auto-generated based on the underlying text and transcripts. So this really makes life simpler if you want to be able to search across video content uh, to get you to a, a more refined uh, way of uh, finding that nugget that you're looking for. Moving on. To the last speech services use case, Ronda, driving contact center understanding. The objective here is to develop a product that allows us to deliver automated quality assessment and compliance monitoring, to provide comprehensive view of customer sentiment and insights into root causes of service failure, and allow improvements in operations. So we've structured this internally across these four components, data, services, reporting, and analytics. From a data perspective, then brings together both service desk information, if this is an IT kind of um, environment, changes, events, incidents, and problems, as well as then the voice recordings, email data, chat data, or survey data. But we also allow you to bring in your data warehouse or other data sources so that you can attach that metadata or richer, create a richer view of the customer and the operations. This is then processed as part of these services, uh, leveraging NLP analysis, audio analysis, and our ASR APIs. And we do this on our Google Cloud platform uh, by ingesting data into BigQuery. This then allows us to deliver these uh, different components. And it's a modular uh, product that we're busy developing, focusing on, first of all, just a, a health dashboard that outlines um, the, all of these different data sources that are collated in one place, then brings much deeper understanding from the text and speech analytics, allows us to drive improvements in data quality through the pipeline and the processing of these data, and also enhance public compliance. Um, we have developed a NPS Explorer that then deals with the survey data and also links that back to some of the root causes of incidents or uh, poor customer service so that you can have a consolidated view of this data. And then lastly, it also enables us to embed chatbot uh, functionality uh, into this contact center environment that leverages uh, the same underlying natural language processing. Lastly, it then brings the insights component, uh, which allows for a number of different elements, including forecasting um, and topic modeling to deliver greater insight to your contact center operation. Okay, 
So that's our speech services section done and dusted. We now move on to some of the computer vision tasks that we've been spending time on. First, I want to focus on uh, what we talk about as image search and retail. Uh, we've created an app that allows visual product search uh, using deep learning um, and added to that some elastic or Google-like text-based search to make it easy to find a specific or a similar product. This is a photo of uh, an old pair of trail running shoes that I want to replace. So I'll snap a, uh, a photo or an image of my, my shoes, uh, upload that in the app and it'll come back with either the same shoes where I can buy those again or recommend similar shoes that uh, might be available to me. Different use case, I'm walking, uh, my wife is walking down uh, the aisle, she sees the latest Manolo Blanix, takes a photo and sees where can she get that online uh, at a better price. So yeah, we've used uh, deep learning uh, with neural nets, um, pre-trained pre image classification uh, to embed, embed images uh, for the fishing group. This was a uh, model was trained on a few million images um, and could classify images in about a thousand classes. And then we use the same process to embed new images and find the nearest uh, match from the TFG catalog. So in effect, allowing you to upload an image and search for that across the, the Fushini Group's uh, online catalog. Uh, we've added elastic search to this uh, based on the metadata of the products to make it then easier to, com to use the combination of uh, both image and text-based search to find the product that you're looking for. This next use case is about celebrity detection in media, and you'll have seen how we use that to do actor recognition as part of the uh, video content search that we've done for the SABC. This is broken up into two parts. First of all, is face detection. So we use pre-trained models such as MTCNN or the Google Face Detection API to identify faces in a particular scene. This reduces the coordinates of the bounding box. So you'll see those on this on the image on the screen and then we extract the faces in the scene and use them in another model to get the identity so we talk about that as actor classification yeah we fine-tune a model to identify an actor given their faces this uses a pre-trained model such as facenet and adds a couple of layers so that the final model ends up with a softmax layer required for typical classification and then we put the two together so you can take an episode, detect each face in a frame, and then determine the identity of all the actors in that scene. And this is really helpful if you want to do more granular search uh, so that you can reduce the search outcome uh, from thousands of results to a really valuable handful of results. So that was some of the computer vision tasks that we've been working on. We now take a look at something different, complex forecasting how to better manage network demand in telecommunications. Yeah, we move away from what is typically seen as AI applications to something more traditional, uh, advanced an advanced analytics problem statement. And the need is to forecast demand for all products in the group to allow better planning of our network capacity and technology that needs to be deployed. So the problem statement was, that the existing forecasting capability is limited and error prone and contributes to a high number of non viable build projects. And so, with that in mind, our objective is then to deliver software that allows for more flexible forecasting across different time horizons, as well as a range of product categories or combinations of product categories. This would then play a critical role in our access core and our network strategy master plans are really important in terms of potential capex, budgeting, and planning. So how could you approach this type of forecasting problem statement? Our starting point was to jump to a single all-in-one model, uh, like a random forest or a neural net. As theoretically, uh, we think this would deal best with the relationships between time series, and it should be able to scale for complexity. However, we found this to be theoretical. Uh, practically, because we had uh, some real data quality issues and some training events that were quite unpredictable, uh, these models didn't perform well. 
and they seem to be get to get a bit confused. So a more reliable practical method may then be to solve one prediction problem at a time in a generic enough way uh, that you're then able to easily build additional models or switch to a multivariate model later on. Um, simple univariate models may also be problematic as they don't learn from each other, but at least they, they're quick to implement and require less data processing. But in the end, we found uh, hierarchical time series models really well suited to this type of problem statement, where there's a hierarchy of products or categories that need to be forecasted. So <clears throat> this considers three options, three main options for forecasting. Uh, top down, where you start at the highest level of aggregation and, 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 and then you uh, do the forecasting and then use statistical techniques to break this down into smaller component forecasts. Or uh, bottom up, where we forecast the individual underlying components and then you aggregate this up uh, to the other higher levels. Here we found the middle out method uh, to work really well for us. And, and so we started with forecasting, forecasting a mid-level category and then aggregate this up to uh, get to the higher level category forecasts or breaking it down uh, into the lower level of, of category uh, component forecast. But I guess the lesson learned is to, to build a simple solution first and iterate on this over time. Um, and confident that as we continue this work and improve our data quality, um, that uh, we will be leveraging uh, more complex multivariate models over time. And lastly, to, to watch out for training data issues. Uh, so the normal spikes and outliers and missing data. Um, but we also had to deal with complex forecasting means such as product migrations or new product launches. Um, and also needed to make some adjustments or to be able to make adjustments for unrealistic forecasting output. And then lastly, we take a quick look at some of the work that we've been doing on the cybersecurity side. This has only been focused internally in the telecom group, um, but has been very rewarding and certainly something that we're looking to expand on in the future. Cybersecurity is such an important topic, and it's been great to, uh, be, to have been able to allow our team to spend some time on getting closer to some of the interesting use cases in this space. Uh, in particular, uh, this project focused on uh, conducting analysis with the intention of finding anomalous behavior amongst user and entity accounts on the top of infrastructure. So imagine user. Uh, so human as well as uh, non-human accounts uh, on the telco infrastructure. So this really just pro provides a basis for us to, to better understand this and then to move forward into deeper analysis or better use of available products in the market. Here you'll see we covered uh, three elements, uh, both the, uh, or the Babylon physical access logs that we use in, in the telecom group. Uh, we used uh, customized version of um, Bloodhound to develop our insights into the Active Directory environment. Um, and then uh, we make use of sale point data for user identity management. But really the focus has been for this uh, case study is on the, the Babylon and the Bloodhound uh, data. So as I mentioned, um, with user entity behavior analysis we focus on we focused on on two of these three components the first being the physical behavior side so the babylon movement access log and logs and the second on the active directory environment using a customized customized version of bloodhound so this first part of the work uh, then focus on um, how we cluster the logs from babylon based on certain patterns ident identified, such as you might have a group of employees who, who take consistent routes as they move through parts of the physical building, um, or patterns in time, such as uh, certain staff that regularly work night shifts. And so any deviation from someone's associated pattern of movement uh, are then identified as cluster outliers, and we can then deem them as potentially anomalous. So an example might be, someone from finance suddenly starts visiting a data center they've never been to before 
uh, this might show malicious intent or that they that the access card of the finance employee has been compromised. So you're reaching clustering and then anomaly detection to identify deviations from the kind of normal physical patterns of our employees. We then expanded this work to allow our security team to be able to formulate scenarios based off these patterns or deviations that are identified. This allows them to take better account of future risk potential, um, which can give them a level of impact or severity if these risks were to come to fruition. So, for example, um, users that commonly access certain areas shouldn't have a potential for property damage or property theft or data theft. So, so those should be of low risk scenarios. Um, but it then makes sense to also account for both negative and positive case scenarios, the disparity uh, within this scenario funnel. So for example, if we if we identify a strange route being taken by someone, but this isn't unique uh, to that one user in the same time frame, and then it might just be as a result of renovations that are happening in the building, causing a detour uh, from the usual routes. Or if we use a negative example, uh, where a user took a route in Cape Town a few minutes ago, um, and then moments later he is showing up physically in Centurion, uh, then that might indicate an access card has been duplicated or stolen. The other component of uh, user entity behavior analysis is then the analysis on Active Directory. So this diagram just shows how certain entities in the Active Directory are connected to one another, and that entities with more centrality in the AD environment will have more impact if they were to be compromised. So for example, yeah, if the domain controller were to be compromised, the risk potential can obviously cascade down all the levels of the entities that the domain controller has influence over. And so uh, indicates greater risk potential. And lastly, this slide then visualizes how we would cluster these active directory entities based off of various characteristics. These characteristics would be weighted according to how much risk potential they have. Um, for example, um, active directory entities with extremely old passwords have a high risk potential because if, if someone managed to gain access to it, they have exposure for a prolonged period of time. Versus if that entity's password is changed often, the risk potential might be lower. And so um, you would weight the, the different risk characteristics, weight the different characteristics um, based on their risk potential, um, and then link that to the anomalous behavior in uh, the clustered entities. By, by tracking back anomalies discovered across both the physical, so the Babylon logs, and the logical, the active directory data, we can then identify symptoms and, and get back to the root cause of some of the issues. Um, so as an example, if a, if a user is found with odd physical movement and two days later we see the same user's AD account accessing a server that's, that it's not meant to have access to, then we can deduct that um, some possible future scenarios where the security team may need to remediate. So in this case, maybe to lock that user's account if that happens and to find out why access to that server environment was provided. So. Even though there are a number of um, user entity behavior analysis products on the market, it's been really helpful for us to come to grips with both the data and the, the context of this work. Um, so we could support some of the customization needed to meet the group's immediate need. But, but this, um, I guess this broader cybersecurity arena is such an important space to be learning in. I'm sure we'll continue to explore this in the future. Thank you so much for spending time with me today. I hope you enjoyed that. You're welcome to reach out to me either at our booth or in the, in the lounge. Uh, we are happy to take some questions. Thank you very much.